Good afternoon. Our next presentation offering us an introduction on cybersecurity. Please welcome the Senior Manager of Cyber Risk Advisory and Program Management Consulting at RSM Canada, Ryan Burrowman. Thank you, Ryan. Hi, Chad. Thanks very much. Um, can you guys hear me? I just wanted to make sure that we do a test like voice check and sound yep, check. I can hear you perfectly okay. fine. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so let me share my screen. Okay, and can you guys see my screen? Yep, we see it. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. All right, well, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, the opportunity to, uh, to be part of this group today. Um, um, it's a pleasure to be part of this group and this uh, this conversation today. So my name is Ryan Boromand. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a senior manager, cybersecurity project management office at RSM Canada at the moment. Um, and I basically lead um, the uh, program and project management for all this cyber security and governance, uh, cyber incident response, um, threat intelligence, um, as well as uh, the incident response team um, for the RSM Canada um, in the capacity of program and project management. So we have a couple of different teams that are responsible for um, the pillars that I mentioned earlier. Um, but basically what we do is just we, uh, we work on the strategy and technical, tactical solutions for our clients within, uh, within Canada and US. So this presentation today is all about cybersecurity. It's an introduction to cybersecurity. So if you are a cybersecurity expert, you probably don't need to be here because uh, I don't want to basically get myself embarrassed, but uh, it's pretty much all about cybersecurity and introduction to cybersecurity. Uh, so this is just, I put this slide just to show you uh, about my career path. So where, how did I start with IT and where did I go and uh, how I actually ended up with cybersecurity. So as you can see, I actually started in 2000 with HP Canada, and then I moved to IBM, CGI, um, uh, IFDS, uh, Deloitte, and RSM Canada. Uh, and for the past couple of years, I've been very much focused on the cybersecurity and uh, cyber risk advisory for, um, you know, working with for different clients and different uh, service providers. So cybersecurity concept, um, that's the first thing that we always talk about when we, when it comes to cybersecurity um, discussions with our clients um, at RSM Canada or prior to that when I was part of Deloitte. Um, we always basically focus on confidentiality, integrity and availability, which is basically called the, the CIA triad. Um, so integrity, confidentiality and availability. Um, the model basically is designed to guide the organizations with the policies of cybersecurity in the realm of information security. So uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, we always look at these, um, the, the, the CIA triad and sort of, you know, start focusing on different aspects of cybersecurity. So integrity is number one, availability is the second, and confidentiality of data is another one. So in this presentation, I have a, like one slide per each um, 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 uh, aspect of the cybersecurity, so we can actually go through, like for example, integrity, availability, and confidentiality, in a little bit more details. Uh, so confidentiality. Um, so it's very important that we, um, when it comes to cybersecurity, it's very it's very important that we always, um, you know, be able to. Um, select different level of confidentiality for the data that we transmit or we transfer to different uh, parties within an organization or outside of the organization. So it's it's the rule that limits the access of information, as you can see in my slide as well. So um, people are allowed or denied the access of information according to its category by authorizing the right person in the department. So what it means is that uh, a lot of the organizations, like in the past uh, couple of years, uh, have come to me and my service providers like RSM Canada or Deloitte or um, at, uh, and other places that I used to work 
um, coming and asking, so how do we sort of provide different categories and different categorizations for data so then we can limit the um, access of people to certain information and certain data within an organization or outside the organization. So for example, a lot of organizations not right now is actually implementing a, a solution that would prevent you know, sending an email to the outside of the organization if it's basically marked or categorized as confidential. So the solution behind it and the infrastructure behind it would limit the transmission of the data to outside of the organization if the user comes back and sort of classify the data as confidential. You know, we have, you know, different categories in when it comes to confidentiality, like for example, internal. So when you classify the data or for example, your email or your documents in an organization um, as uh, internal, you can only transfer and send and receive emails or the data or share the data through SharePoint or different media like, you know, um, Draw one drive, one drive, uh, Google, Google Drive, um, Dropbox, whatever means that you have implemented in your organization, you can by classifying the data, you can actually sort of uh, limit the uh, access to the certain information, and you can only, for example, you know, transfer the data within the organization internally if you classify them as internal, um, and unless you basically just you know classify the data as public which in that case, the technology behind it would definitely, you know, uh, allow you to transfer and transmit the data within the organization and outside of the organization. Okay, so that's the confidentiality, which is the um, base uh, of the cybersecurity and uh, information security, if you will. The other um, pillar is the integrity. So. All we basically try to do is always, when it comes to integrity within cybersecurity, is just we always try to make sure that the data that is being uh, used by the users or user community um, and uh, you know engineers, scientists, um, anyone within the organization uh, is always consistent, is always accurate and trustworthy over its time period. So. Again, it's very important that we also consider a time period for the data, meaning that we should basically also consider an expiry for certain data. Um, do we want to basically consider an expiry for uh, data that is in transit, or do we want to make, make sure that it's like, you know, get uh, all uh, deleted, or is it basically being accessed? Um, when it's going to be accessed, do we have an expiry for the access of the data? So these are things that we also consider when it comes to integrity of the data. So the validation of data is another part of the cybersecurity that we basically perform. Um, the um, ensuring that the data is consistent and accurate and transparent over its time period is um, obviously the number one. Um, so file permissions is, for example, another area that we consider um, when it comes to integrity of data. User access controls are another measure that we use when it comes to uh, controlling the data breach. Um, there are tools and technologies that we implement to detect changes or breach in the data. Um, some of the organizations, as you can see on my slide, they use, for example, checksum um, or uh, cryptographic checksum to verify the integrity of data. Um, to make sure that we also don't run into the, the loss of data or accidental deletion of data, for example, by human errors, which is very, very common, um, is um, by you know running the backups on our data as well. That is also another factor and another um, way for us to uh, ensure data integrity within the organization. Um, the cloud backups are actually now the most trusted solution for this. So when it comes to um, you know implementing a, a backup solution in an organization, um, like in the past couple of years, we've always you know provided a recommendation or a strategy approach to our clients to make sure that they uh, consider and implement a cloud-based backup solution for their organizations. Um, 
the other thing that I would actually add is that I think I touched on that earlier that um, human errors is something that would cause a lot of uh, troubles and inconsistency when it comes to data and data integrity. And I can actually tell you based on the um, statistics that you know my organization RSM Canada has run uh, for the past couple of years, we can see that the number of human errors uh, causing data integrity issues is actually higher than the number of cyber attacks that would cause data integrity issues. So it's very important that we run uh, a proper cybersecurity awareness program within the organization to um, manage and control the, uh, the amount of data uh, integrity issues caused by human errors. Okay. Now, the other one was the other one within the cybersecurity pillars was the services availability. So a lot of times the cyber attacks uh, that when, when they happen, they cause um, an impact on the services availability within the organization. So like, for example, when you um, when you run into a situation that, you know, your organization is being attacked by a ransomware or um, a denial of service attack. Um, so that will basically bring the, for example, your website down. So that's a service unavailability or service availability issue within your organization. So a lot of times we need to have, um, you know, uh, certain uh, measures in place like firewalls. You know, we have to have disaster recovery plans in place. We have to have proxy servers, proper backup solutions, proper uh, HA or high availability in place so then we can for example if you know one of our uh, web servers is under is under attack then we can easily fail over to another web server that is probably or most suitably 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 is located in another uh, geographical location in the country like for example if you have one uh, web server in toronto uh, and if it's if, if, if you find it under attack um, then we can fail over our services to another uh, web server web server in Vancouver for a high availability of our services until we recover the cyber attack and we basically you know put some measures into place to uh, to uh, uh, address the issue with the cyber attack on the services that were under attack. So availability in terms of unnecessary components like hardware, software, network devices and security equipment uh, should all be maintained and upgraded. So it's also important that we consider upgrading our technology infrastructure at all times to make sure that we, they are running on the most up to date versions and firmware. Um, and we certainly can actually uh, ensure that the smooth functioning and access of data without any disruptions. Um, Another thing is like, for example, when it comes to the bandwidth, a lot of the cyber attacks would actually utilize our, our, our bandwidth um, when it comes to network security. So um, it's also important that we have uh, alternative way of you know, providing bandwidth to our services and servers. So then, you know, in case of a cyber attack uh, or, you know, cyber attack, you know, causing a flood into bandwidth, then we can go back and, you know, provide an alternative bandwidth to the services that are actually utilizing that bandwidth in the in the organization. OK. So when it comes to cybersecurity, um, I actually put two slides or two, three slides here for um, for everyone as again, very, very, very basic. Um, um, most of you may actually know about this, but just to uh, summarize what we know about like the threats and tools. So what are the most common threats um, and what are the most common tools within the um, cybersecurity? Obviously, number one is antivirus. I think every every user would know that user antivirus um, uh, or um, antivirus software are basically the best and the most common um, software, cybersecurity software that could actually prevent a cyber attack. Um, but the question is that are they also able to, you know, um, recover? a cyber attack or recover provides recovery to uh, after a cyber attack it happens obviously the the answer is no are they also um capable of preventing 
um, a cyber attack to, for example, um, a website? Um, so the answer is most likely no most of, for most of the antivirus software. When it comes to malware, so it's important that we understand that the malware uh, is a malicious software, um, is a blanket term um, for any kind of computer software with malicious intent. Um, so it basically provides um, it provides the uh, the the, uh, the person that is actually behind the wrongdoing um, to uh, steal information uh, from um, the uh, the victim here in the, uh, in the in the user community. Uh, a lot of times, these uh, uh, attacks are actually happening when it comes to online uh, activities. Uh, so. Pretty much malware is very, it's a, it's a totally a blanket term for any kind of computer software with malicious intent. Ransomware, which is something that is growing uh, dramatically uh, for the past couple of years, um, something that would actually take over your uh, data um, and uh, pretty much locks down the user out of their files and their devices. And then the, uh, the, the, the the person behind the wrongdoing uh, pretty much starts to demand an anonymous online payment to restore the access uh, to the data. Uh, a lot of times, uh, I think you know, in the in the news, we, we 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 hear and we read about this you know ransomware attack, which is again a very growing um, um, attack in the industry, the cybersecurity industry, and a lot of times. Uh, um, unfortunately, you know, there are no uh, easy way or the easy answer to recovery of the data. Unless we go back to the integrity of data and unless we have proper, for example, data backup uh, and most recent backup of the data so we can actually restore the data to the uh, with, with, with minimum loss of the data in this case. Um, adware is obviously is a form of malware. It's again coming from the malware community or malware family. Um, it hides on your device. Uh, it serves you ad with advertisement. So the only thing that you know, it it may be just you know, uh, it provides some disruptions to your work during the day um, because it keeps basically providing with different advertisement. It also um, sort of monitor your behavior uh, for your online activity, so it can target you with a specific ad as well. So. For example, if you're, you know, on Instagram or Facebook and you, you know, start checking, um, you know, Amazon for um, like an office chair, for example, and then you go back to Instagram and you realize that your Instagram is, you know, showing you uh, all of a sudden an ad on office chair and you realize that, you know, what, 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 how did this happen? Like I just checked Amazon for an office chair and now an ad is showing up on my Instagram. So that's, that's how you know, the online, um, there are adware uh, on your device that is actually monitoring your activities and targeting or specifying target uh, or uh, sort of building target targeted ads uh, for your other online activities or using your online um, uh, technologies that you're using basically for online activities. Spyware. Um, spyware is a form of malware as well. So again, it's coming from the uh, malware community. It hides on your device uh, or devices and it monitors your activity and it steals, unfortunately, sensitive data like your bank information. So if you have, if, if your systems or your um, user community technology platforms are impacted or affected by spyware, you need to understand that, you know, um, you your your very confidential data when it comes to back comes back to confidentiality of data. So those um, confidential data is actually being um, uh, stolen from your user community and your you know your devices, um, including like for example bank 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 data information so on and so forth. Now. The term hacker, I think everybody knows about the term hacker here in this case. Um, Hacking refers to an activity that seeks to compromise digital devices, computers, smartphones, tablets, uh, or entire network. Hackers are motivated by personal gain to make a statement uh, or just because they can. Um, so a lot of them 
they just basically try to practice their hacking um, skills on a user or a victim's machine. Um, some of them are actually just basically doing it for personal gain. And a lot of times, you know, we have ethical hacker that actually help the organizations to build a stronger uh, cybersecurity framework for their organization. So we have, so hacker is not necessarily a bad thing or a bad person. So that's why we basically call them like ethical hackers um, that pretty much, you know, test your organization, test your uh, cybersecurity measures um, to make sure that you are uh, protected against, you know, cybersecurity uh, hacking attacks. Phishing is another method of tricking you uh, into share, uh, sharing passwords. So when it comes to phishing, or we have also smishing, which is the SMS version of phishing, um, is something that, you know, you've probably seen it many times uh, for the past couple of years that, you know, you get an email with uh, like, for example, from Amazon, and you realize that, you know, Amazon is asking you to enter your username and password again for no reason. Um, and then when you look at the uh, email address that the email is coming from, you realize that it's actually coming from a Gmail account rather than Amazon, for example, Amazon.com or um, a, a, a very legit uh, email address. So you realize that, okay, well, it's a phishing email, but not everybody would realize that, unfortunately. And a lot of times the users are, you know, become the victim of these phishing attacks or uh, smishing attacks because right now we also have SMSs that are being sent to different smartphones and phones and asking for your username or asking to click on a link uh, which will actually take you to another um, website that would provide um, you know that would actually start stealing your information and uh, data. So um, it's another method of attack it's it's a very common it's extremely common uh, within the organizations or within, you know, the user community to uh, become a victim of phishing. Uh, no matter how expert you are, some of the phishing attacks or methods may be so uh, look, it, it, it may look very legit that, you know, even like, you know, experts in cybersecurity may also click, you know, uh, accidentally click on the link and uh, become a victim of a phishing attack. And, um, and that's why basically, you know, the, um, cybersecurity and cyber criminals, uh, they still use this no matter how um, common this is. They still use phishing and smishing for stealing bad password information or maybe just, you know, by, you know, um, getting access to your organization network and uh, injecting, um, like, for example, a ransomware, a ransomware or a spyware into your organization network as well. And data breach um, comes as a result of a cyber attack, obviously. It allows cyber criminals to gain authorized access to computer systems and network, and is still the private, sensitive, and confidential personal and financial data of the customer or the users contained within. So data breaches, again, it can be the result of a phishing attack. Um, when it comes to phishing, um, the user within the organization may click on a link It'll take them to uh, an external site, um, and the external site may start, you know, uh, using an in, in, an injection um, of the uh, like a, a spyware um, uh, code into your organization, and which may actually cause a data breach in your organization. So that that is something that will cause an in data integrity issue, as we discussed earlier in the in the presentation. Now, moving on to the next steps is that now, how do we basically um, protect our files and devices? Um, very easy answers, but very hard to follow. So update your software. So making sure that always your software and your information uh, uh, are up to date. They have properly uh, classified um, we have like, you know, making sure that we have checksum uh, integrity uh, as part of our data governance model in the organization. Making sure that they are, that our files and data is always backup, backed up um, using external hard drive, 
um, using you know cloud uh, backup solutions, um, making sure that always the passwords are up to date. Um, everything we should, if we can enable password for our data, we should basically make sure that you know the passwords are always up to date and they are um, not easy passwords as well. So as complex as possible and as lengthy as possible. Um, encrypt the devices if we can actually encrypt our devices. Uh, including laptops, tablets, smartphones, removable devices. Uh, we should make sure that we know we uh, implement an encryption uh, for our data as well. And definitely nowadays we we have the technology for multi-factor authentication. So, for example, if you're logging into your Amazon account or your uh, Microsoft account, make sure that you enable uh, two-factor or multi-factor authentication for your um, technologies as well. Um, smart security, so make sure that you know we require, require strong password as uh, as I mentioned earlier and train the staff. Um, it's very important that you know we have an educated user community when it comes to cybersecurity. So cybersecurity is sometimes unfortunately being forgotten um, because of the budget issues, because of uh, you know the strategy change in the organization, the cybersecurity becomes something you know on the side in an organization so make sure that it's not the case making sure that you know we always train the staff uh, and provide um, um, our employees with you know um, a, a considerable amount of uh, information uh, to make sure that the uh, the, uh, the the user community is uh, fully up to date with regards to the latest trends and uh, cyber uh, news um, in the community and also have a plan. So making sure that we always have a plan in case of an attack happens. So it's very important that we always have a business continuity plan in place, a disaster recovery plan in place. So then in case, for example, we are um, attacked by a ransomware, uh, then we don't have to pay the ransom uh, to um, the criminals in this case. So we can actually easily just restore them from data from backup and go for, um, you know, restoring the backup um, on, onto, onto our infrastructure as well. Um, now, I just wanted to also touch on the um, NIST cybersecurity framework. So we have many different framework when, when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, one of them is NIST. Um, and NIST actually stands for, um, the uh, National Institute of Standard and Technology at the US Department of Commerce. So this cybersecurity framework basically helped the businesses for all sizes to better understand, manage, and reduce their cybersecurity risk and protect their network and data. So it's a framework, it's the best practice. It's not something that you have to implement in your organization, but for example, if you come back and ask me, that, okay, Ryan, so how do I actually implement a cybersecurity framework in my organization? Um, I can just tell you that, you know, just follow the NIST best practice and see if you can actually follow and, and implement the best practice as much as possible in your organization. So it's a framework um, that you can, it's a standard that you can uh, follow and um, implement in your organization to be able to um, identify protect, detect, respond, and recover uh, at the time of a cyber attack in your organization. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the NIST cybersecurity framework uh, is to work with your business in these five areas. Again, and I repeat, it's just to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And in the next couple of slides, uh, I'm going to go through identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover, and talk about them a little bit more. So identify and protect. So what is identify? It's very important for an organization to be able to identify um, a cyber attack in an organization. So a lot of times, it takes a lot of time for us to be able to identify a cyber attack. And 
during that time until we identify that the cyber attack has happened or has occurred in the organization, it might be too late. <clears throat> so our ability to identify um, a cyber attack in an organization uh, on a timely manner, it's, it, it's very important. That's why a lot of organizations, they hire, for example, RSM Canada here in this case, or Deloitte, or KPMG, or PwC, for example, just to go and help them in terms of, you know, finding and being able to identify and detect um, the, the cyber attack. So it's very important that we identify what are the cyber attacks and what are the vulnerabilities within the organization. Protect is also when once we identify what are the vulnerabilities, what are the crown jewels in the organization, what are the uh, um, you know, uh, important assets within the organization. And once we know exactly how to detect these issues, then we can actually put a plan together to protect these crown jewels and uh, important assets within the organization. So it's important that we have cybersecurity software to protect the data, encrypt the sensitive data, conduct regular backup of the data, update security software regularly and automating those updates, and also very important, very important is to have a formal policy for safely disposing of electronic files and old devices. Because a lot of times the attacks may actually trigger it and um, by, you know, utilizing older software and older information that are not anymore in use, but they have a pattern for the cyber criminals to find a way into our organization network. And also the last, the last but not the least is just to train everyone on how to use their electronic devices. Uh, detect, respond and recover the, uh, the three elements that uh, or actions that would actually help us in terms of the cyber attack is to monitor your computers, uh, making sure that you know all the computers and systems and technology uh, uh, service providers or servers are actually in fact protected. Um, so uh, monitoring is very important. Again, a lot of organizations, they pay um, other cybersecurity experts and organizations in the industry to monitor, uh, to provide monitoring services in, to an organization. So I'll give you an example. A lot of, like for example, in case of like BMO Bank of Montreal, um, they may actually hire another service provider organization like um, IBM, for example, in this case, to come and just monitor BMO Bank of Montreal um, network for any vulnerability or any cyber attack, just to monitor, not doing anything else, but just to monitor. So then we can detect a, a cyber attack. And then once the detection is there, and once a, a cyber attack has been detected, then we can also go back to, for example, in this case, IBM to be able to respond to the cyber attack. So responding means that notifying customers, employees and others uh, that we are at risk, keeping business operational. So making sure that there is no disruptions to the service um, and, you know, taking other measures or technical measures like rebooting or, uh, you know, um, investigating and containing attack. Um, and uh, preparing or basically failing over to another site and things like that. So that's basically what we call it, the respond to an attack. And uh, when it comes to um, recover is again, putting the uh, uh, everything back together. So imagine like, you know, we are now containing the attack. Now, how do we go back to the business as usual, which is the recover. So repair and restore the equipment uh, and parts of your network that were affected and keep employees and customers informed on your response and recovery activities. During the response and recover, what is very important is just to document the lessons learned as well, and always just go back to the lessons learned and make sure that you know all that the uh, lessons learned are captured, uh, action items are being addressed, and uh, we are prepared in case of the next cyber attack in an organization. So I'm just going to conclude here. Um, so in an organization to accomplish an effective cybersecurity approach, 
um, we need to understand that, you know, we need to make sure that everything and everybody is considered people, process, computers, network, technology. All of these things are responsible equally um, in terms of protecting against a cyber attack. Um, if one of these elements or components within an organization are actually becoming a victim of the cyber attack, you need to understand that it is going to uh, impact the organization by all means and by, by um, uh, an impact will be pretty much on all other um, components of the uh, of the organization. So it would be on people, it would be on process, computers, technology and so on and so forth. So um, the other thing that I wanted to add before I conclude here is that, you know, running a regular audit on your uh, cybersecurity um, framework or, or practice or organization is also very important, like running an, an um, 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 biannual basis on a, on a biannual basis or semi-annual basis, um, uh, running an audit and performing an audit on your cybersecurity capabilities. Um, it's, it's also going to help um, the organizations and um, the individuals in terms of being being able to protect the environment and being able to protect the infrastructure against cyber attacks. So I'd like to conclude and um, hand it over to you, Chad, for I guess any questions um, or I know actually I finished a little sooner than usual, but uh, than the, than the plan. But uh, that's pretty much uh, all about my presentation at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. That was a great presentation, uh, offering us an overview of cybersecurity and the obligation for people, organizations, and different practices we can take. Um, does anybody have any questions, possibly for Ryan? Ryan, I have a question for you. Uh, considering um, a lot of our other presentations today are revol revolving around AI, do you have an opinion on how artificial intelligence impacts cybersecurity? Definitely. So, um, a lot of times, you know, when it comes to uh, so, um, so let me actually, you know, backward a little bit. So, when it comes to, for example, here in this case of uh, detect and respond, uh, right, and uh, when it comes to identification of the uh, you know, um, the crown jewels. So when it comes to identify, protect, detect, respond, recover, they all um, are now being, um, you know, we, we started to actually use artificial intelligence for um, learning more about, you know, cyber criminals activities and behavior um, when it comes to their attacks and being able to prepare ourselves a little bit more um, in terms of like you know respond to the cyber attack so a lot of the organizations when it comes to detect and monitor um, they use um, you know um, artificial intelligence solutions uh, like phantom or uh, demisto right now these are pretty much the ones that are actually coming to my mind when it comes to um, monitoring their, their their infrastructure so there is always an integration between, for example, Demisto, which is a an artificial intelligence solution, uh, working hand to hand with a monitoring solution like, for example, Splunk. Here in this case, so um, a lot of organizations uh, they use Splunk or um, IBM Q Radar or Log Rhythm. I don't know if you if anybody is familiar with these terminologies. These are the solutions that you know organizations uh, right now. They're very common solutions that organizations they use to monitor their infrastructure, but then they integrate with you know other solutions that utilizes artificial intelligence um, and uh, um, like you know Phantom, for example, in this case, or Demisto, to uh, also monitor cyber criminals' behavior and threat uh, um, landscape. Um, to understand the threat that landscape within the, within the industry on a day-to-day -day basis or a minute-by-minute -minute basis, so then we can actually respond and recover um, um, in case of a cyber attack, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Uh, looks like we have another question here. 
Um, what are the most common errors that people do that drastically affect the cybersecurity in a company? And what can companies do to minimize the employees' mistakes uh, that can prejudice the company's security? Well, that's an excellent question. And I think we touched on it uh, a little bit earlier in the presentation. So human errors is basically the most common um, and the most common error when it comes to um, you know um, affecting cybersecurity framework within an organization. Like for example, phishing. Uh, phishing is the most common, like right now by trend, is the number one um, root cause of a cybersecurity breach in organizations uh, in 2020, 2021. So um, it's still phishing, I know we, it may be very uh, hard to believe um, because we probably a lot of us we, we should be able to you know, identify a phishing email, but not everybody in an organization that is not a cybersecurity expert or even not very much familiar with the technology is able to identify. And the, you know, the number of user community, the users in the user community is quite large. So um, unfortunately, the phishing is still number one uh, when it comes to uh, human errors, clicking on an um, um, wrong link at the same, like, you know, uh, and, and you know, uh, exposing the infrastructure and organizations crown jewels to the external um, network and causing uh, issues when it comes to, you know, cybersecurity and, um, and things. And how do we minimize this um, employee's mistake is just by providing user training and user cybersecurity awareness in the organization. Thank you. Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, often a lot of, uh, it seems a lot of breaches that companies have are due to social engineering um, and type methods that would be used, I guess, in phishing as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Correct. Do we have any other questions for Ryan? We have uh, plenty of time for some questions here. I guess everybody uh, is a cybersecurity expert here, so <laughs> we don't have a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm sure great. they'll reach out to you via yeah. email uh, yeah, to, to possibly follow up yeah, or, or network with you. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, happy to network with the people here uh, and uh, and and work um, potentially in in the future. So definitely. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ryan, for your presentation today. Of course. Um, Thank you very and, much uh, again we'll be... for the opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we'll be providing Ryan's info as well as this presentation to be viewed later for anybody that uh, wishes to reach out to him or to uh, um, review this presentation again. Oh, we have another question. Uh, do you think that home office jobs that are in evidence nowadays are prepared for security? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, the short answer is no. The short answer is no, because um, you know they have, when it comes to home office equipment, they are, um, you know, from a cybersecurity um, aspects, um, they are not being monitored properly, uh, and they are very much exposed to the external or the external network and, and attacks. Even though a lot of times, you know, we use VPN, for example, to connect to the internal network. It all depends on. What type of like, I mean, the short answer is no, but you know, if you want to get into the details, it all depends on how your organization is preparing your devices and handing over your devices to you uh, when it comes to, you know, um, you know, for example, you know, uh, using a laptop. So imagine you're you're working for an organization. If your organization is giving you a laptop to work from home, um, it all depends on how the software on that laptop is being managed. Um, are the ports, for example, the USB ports are locked or closed or are they open? Um, are you able to, for example, when you're trying to log into your laptop, are you able to see your name every single time that you're trying to log into your laptop? Or are you supposed to enter your username or password every single time you're trying to log in? Because that's how it should be. If you see your name, that means that you know your credentials is being saved somewhere, which is not supposed to be the case. So pretty much every single time you should see 
uh, a blank username and password so you should actually log in. So these are things that you know we talk about. Um, it all depends on how your end user devices or how the end user devices are being protected because these are the end user devices that are now located at home offices are the gateway um, for uh, an, uh, an exposure to the external uh, threats in the organization. Thank you, and you touched upon that with um, the importance of two-factor authentication, um, you know, to uh, to assure that uh, even, I guess, if uh, once you do log in and put your information in, that uh, there's another um, absolutely another area that you have to pass through to identify absolutely. who you are. Absolutely, yeah, great point, a great point. Yeah, so you know, USB ports, um, antivirus software, um, VPNing into the office. Um, making sure that for example your email is only connected to the office a network only when you are vpning in um, a lot of organizations they don't you know enable that you know sometimes you may actually work on your work laptop and you realize that your email uh, using your outlook is connected to exchange server without even you are vpning in so that's that's not a problem right there so that's another gap uh, so when we do cybersecurity assessment, these are things that we uh, consider when it comes to gap analysis for, like, for example, end user devices. 